Hello, I'm Marcel Weeder, host of The Point. We're going to take a little tour around the world and talk about politics internationally. On this edition of The Point, we have Craig Varoga, president of Varoga & Associates from Washington, D.C., David Weinberg, vice president of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security, and from Vienna, we have Christoph Hoffinger, managing partner of Sora. All that on The Point. Joining me today from Washington, D.C. is Craig Varoga, President of Varoga & Associates, a Democratic strategist. Thank you for joining us today, Craig. Hey, Marcel, happy to be here. So, Craig, lots of stuff happening in Washington. Obviously, we've got the impeachment uh, trial going on in the Senate today, as well as a peace initiative, as well as the upcoming Iowa caucuses for the Democrats. So let's start off with what's happening in the Senate. And uh, it's now the Republicans' turn. The president's defense team is mounting its defense in the Senate. Uh, we had, over the weekend, and a bombshell of uh, Bolton and uh, claims in an upcoming book that uh, the New York Times was uh, given a copy of uh, that the president did use his influence to withhold aid to Ukraine. And how are people in Washington? I've seen a couple of clips that said that uh, some Republicans are now thinking they may actually call Bolton to the stand. Well, we, I mean, it's Tuesday. Uh, the Senate's not going to vote on that until Friday. I think probably what we'll see is that Mitch McConnell, who's the Senate Majority Leader for the Republicans, who says that he's going to do everything he can to help the White House. Interesting position for somebody who's supposed to be a juror to be. But, you know, McConnell will wait until Friday uh, to see, you know, how this thing plays out. But I do think that it was a bombshell uh, in terms of it probably you know, is causing a lot more nervousness on the Republican side uh, than they were previously feeling. And, you know, I mean, if, there's a, if there has been a consensus is that, it is that the trial didn't matter, uh, that Republicans were going to vote to acquit uh, Democrats, most of them, you know, they thought all uh, would vote uh, to remove. Uh, and the Bolton, uh, you know, I mean, the, the Bolton revelations in the New York Times, you know, are a variable that nobody had anticipated, even though people thought that if Bolton actually testified, uh, it might be significant. So I think it's going to take a couple of days, but it's a variable that nobody was expecting at this time. And moving along, in terms of Iowa, there are several senators uh, that are locked up in Washington during the impeachment trial that haven't been able to get out to Iowa, uh, leaving the field open for some of the ones who are not uh, elected to uh, try and shore up some support. The polls now show that Bernie Saunders, I've seen several different polls uh, giving him anywhere from a one to a nine point lead. Uh, they have uh, Buttigieg uh, playing uh, close second and then Warren and then a few others. What's your take on what's happening in Iowa? I mean, I, I've done a lot of work in Iowa in the past, worked for Tom Vilsack, who was the governor there, and you know, lived there for a while. Uh, the caucuses are very difficult to predict unless you're there you know, on caucus night. Uh, they've changed the rules a little bit in the last you know, for this cycle. Uh, they're, you know, they're, you know, they're, they'll be a little bit different. Uh, it is an organizational game uh, at the end. Uh, it does seem that you know Sanders has some momentum. Uh, Biden has been durable. Uh, Warren got the endorsement of the Des Moines Register. Right. Uh, I mean, you know, Mayor Pete, you know, he, he's you know run an extraordinary campaign uh, in many ways, and he's a Midwesterner, and I don't think anybody's going to count him out. Uh, but he seems to have. I mean, you know, the, you know, it's you know. It, you know the the road to uh, you know the road to ruin is paved with uh, predictions about politics in Iowa, maybe in particular. Uh, but Mayor Pete seemed to have peaked about two months ago. Warren peaked about three months ago. Sanders seems to be peaking. 
at a good time uh, for his campaign. But when you get into the caucuses, you know, because they, I mean, you know, your viewers may not know about the 15% rule, uh, but when they have the caucus, if you don't have 15%, uh, you have to realign uh, with one of the other campaigns. Uh, and that means that, I mean, people, I mean, there's something, you know, we call Iowa nice, you know, where Iowans, you know, are, you know, not, you know, part of either the coastal elite or the coastal obnoxious. Uh, and they're generally, you know, nice people who mean well. But in the caucuses, it's really important to be nice because your opponent uh, at, in the early part of the evening, maybe your ally uh, later in the evening. And some of those candidates, uh, they're not going to have 15% across the board. I think Mayor Pete's probably one of them. So, you know, where he or Klobuchar or others, you know, throw their support, you know, for other candidates during the course of the evening, that's going to have a big effect in terms of who wins, uh, and who wins the caucuses. And, you know, I think that right now, everyone that I talk to, and I would be one of them, nobody on or off the record is really confident about making a decision. The only people who are somewhat confident about it are the campaigns themselves, and they're doing that for spin. Now, a lot of people expected Klobuchar to do much better than she is, uh, according to the polls. Yeah, look, I mean, I think that she's, I mean, in many ways has a lot of assets and is a very appealing candidate in some ways, you know, and I don't think, it, I think it's too early. We're six days before the caucuses. We're too early to write somebody off. But right now, you know, I think the conventional wisdom is right that there are four candidates, you know, that being Sanders, Biden, Warren, and Mayor Pete, you know, who are in contention. But that doesn't mean that Amy Klobuchar is not a factor and that if there was anybody who was going to have, you know, a better than expected performance, you know, she might be the one. And in terms of Biden, he's leading nationally from every indi every poll that I've uh, seen. Um, may not necessarily lead individual states, but he seems to have a commanding uh, lead nationally. How is that playing out? Well, I mean, a, a lot of the vice president's support comes from African Americans, who are the most loyal uh, constituent group in uh, the Democratic Party. Uh, but Iowa does not have a you know large minority population of any kind. It does not have a large African American uh, population. So his support in the state is somewhat understated compared to the national polls. Uh, but he's been durable there, and he's remained in the hunt. So it's like I. You know, I wouldn't write him off uh, at all, you know, but I think that, you know, it's like his strength, you know, will, you know, you know, may come to bear in later states, South Carolina being one of the first and, you know, other states, you know, on Super Tuesday and other, you know, I mean, as we move through the calendar. Now, conventional Winston says that no matter who the Democrats elect as their uh, as their uh, presidential candidate, it seems that it's Trump's to lose and the November election. Uh, look, I, you know, I, I was one of those people in 2016 that I kept saying to uh, friends, colleagues, clients, reporters that um, I thought Trump was in a strong uh, position. I did not, I wasn't predicting he was going to win, but I thought he would be very competitive for a number of reasons. We don't have to litigate the past, but I do think it informs, you know, one way to look at the coming year, you know, and the way in which, you know, I would, you know, ask your viewers to look at it is that, you know, Trump has 40% of the vote tied down. Uh, you know, he famously said years ago that he could shoot somebody uh, on Sixth Avenue in, in New York and it, you know, they would still vote for him. Uh, I think we're seeing that in the, in the Senate trial, uh, despite the Bolton bombshell. 60%, somewhere between 55 and 60% of the country want to vote against Donald Trump. Uh, and if that's how the vote ended up, uh, Donald Trump would lose. However, however, and this is, this is a big deal, we don't yet know who the Democratic opponent is. Uh, right now, the Trump campaign has not been focused uh, with any kind of you know laser efficiency on any one of the candidates you know who are running against him, uh, he's not going to run a campaign to win. He's going to run a campaign to try to force uh, the Democratic nominee, whoever that is, uh, to lose. So that's the biggest variable. You know, I think that. You know, it's like it's a question of, you know, how far down below 60 uh, the Democrat falls, uh, you know, one, just based on the natural, you know, politics of a, you know, a year long campaign. And two, you know, who the nominee is. And we don't know who the nominee is yet. So that's that's the biggest variable, obviously. Now, there are two billionaires running for the Democrats. You've got Bloomberg and you've got Steyer. 
neither of them seem to be having a major impact, even though we're told that Bloomberg has spent upwards of $200 million on his campaign, and it's only been in the field for less than a month or so. Yeah. There there are some polls that show Steyer doing well uh, in Nevada, you know, all things considered, and where some pundits have said that he has some momentum uh, in Nevada. It doesn't seem to be the case in either Iowa uh, or New Hampshire you know, for Steyer. Bloomberg has made a very deliberate and strategic decision to skip the first four primaries, and he really is the wild card uh, in assessing uh, you know how the democratic field you know plays out. There's an old truism that people don't stop running for president uh, because they lose primaries; they stop running because they run out of money. Exactly. Uh, so, I mean, you have, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, you have Sanders and, and Warren who have a very significant individual donor base, and then you have Steyer and uh, and Bloomberg, you know, who are not constrained uh, by fundraising and can just you know put their own money in. So. There is structurally the potential for this to be a long race. Uh, Bloomberg has just hired an awful lot of people. Uh, I mean, he has, in addition to all the money he spent on TV, I think he's hired a thousand staffers or somewhere in that neighborhood. That's unprecedented. Uh, he's building organizations that are outside of the first four states, those being Iowa, New Hampshire, uh, Nevada, and South Carolina. So it, it, it's it's a big variable, and you know, very few people know you know what to think about it. But it's like his name ID is increasing. Uh, and, you know, people just, I mean, it's, it's anecdotal now, but people are starting to talk about him a little bit, uh, whereas, you know, two months ago they weren't. So it's, you know, again, we'll see. It's but there are an awful lot of error. This is, this really is kind of unprecedented. I don't know any other election where six days before the Iowa caucuses that most pundits or prog prognosticators really didn't have uh, much of an opinion uh, about who the nominee would end up being. Uh, it's very interesting. Now, shifting just uh, slightly, the Democratic Party itself has some some issues internally. Uh, there's a very strong and vocal faction that's on the very left of the party and it seemed to be pulling it even further left and seems to be out of step with what most Americans feel comfortable in terms of politics. How do you see that playing out? Well, I mean, you know, you know, one way, you know, for your viewers, you know, to think about it is that if both the liberals and the NDP were the same party, you know, that's, you know, who the Democratic Party is, you know, and instead of there being three parties, there's two. Mm -hmm. uh, there are people, you know, who are worried uh, that if the Democratic Party goes too far left, that in this election, that they'll hand the election to, uh, to you know to Trump, just the way that you know many people believe that the Labour Party and uh, you know the UK you know, handed the election to Boris Johnson, despite the fact that Johnson wasn't very popular himself. Um, you know, I don't think we're there yet. You know, I think that the. Um, you know, I mean, again, you know, we'll see. I mean, there are people who will, you know, I mean, you know, swear on a Bible that if it's uh, Bernie Sanders that he's going to lose and he's going to lose by an awful lot. And then there are progressives, you know, who say that, you know, you have to energize the base. You know, I think that, you know, I mean, where I think we need to be is that we have to be very attentive, you know, to the 20 percent of the voters in the United States who are not Democrats, who want to vote against Donald Trump and who want him to be defeated. And I think that, you know, they deserve, you know, to be part of this conversation. And so far, you know, during the primary, you know, th they haven't been the focus because they're not the people who participate in Democratic caucuses and primaries. Well, Mm -hmm. And speaking of Donald Trump, he was the first president to attend a Right to Life uh, rally in Washington, D.C. last week. Yeah, I mean, look, he he has, you know, I mean, d despite the fact that, you know, that he does not exhibit the piety of many practicing Christians, uh, you know, he's made a very deliberate decision to cater to that constituency. And, you know, they have shown him voter loyalty. Uh, regardless of what his past, you know, may have been, you know, is that really who he is? You know, I guess there, are, you know, I cannot look into the soul of anybody, but it's it probably isn't. Uh, but you know, in terms of you know getting advice, you know, from his political consultants, he made a political calculation to do that. Mm -hmm. And really, we haven't seen much else of Trump's initiatives either either domestically or internationally yet today. 
he is in the White House with uh, the Israeli uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu presenting his peace plan. And he's using that to leverage domestically to take attention away from the impeachment, as well as to bolster support within the Christian uh, evangelical community with some of the proposals that he's making. Look, I mean, you know, you can love him or hate him or think that this is right or think that this is wrong, but everything he does is driven by TV appearances. And, uh, you know, when there are foreign leaders in the United States, you know, he invites them to the White House and they end up being props, uh, you know, in a camera opportunity, you know, at the White House. You know, I, you know, you know, have a great regard, you know, for the state of Israel. Uh, I think it's unfortunate that they're being used as campaign props. Uh, but you know, we'll, we'll 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 see how that we'll see how that plays out. But clearly, you know, I don't think that anyone thinks that, uh, that you know that the Trump administration is going to achieve peace in the Middle East. This is this is about the election. You're correct. So, getting away from the personalities, what are the central issues? Is the economy a key issue in the U.S.? What is going to be driving the 2020 election and getting voters' attention? Well, I think that I mean healthcare will always be uh, an issue, you know, in this election because the Trump administration uh, wants to take healthcare away, uh, wants to repeal Obamacare, which at this point is taking healthcare away uh, from Americans. Uh, the economy, uh, you know, if you look at the big macro numbers like the stock market, the economy is doing well. However, uh, if you look at the people who've uh, withdrawn from the labor force. Uh, because they're discouraged workers, uh, that's a factor. If you look at income inequality, income inequality should be a significant factor. You know, I also think that if you you know take a look at the states that are the swing states, in many cases the economy is not doing as well there uh, as it's doing in other states. Uh, and you know, I think that you know whether it's Michigan, Pennsylvania, or Wisconsin, that you know we'll hear a lot about the economy. Uh, in those places. And then, you know, I just think that, you know, it's like a lot of people who even believe uh, that the economy is going well, you know, they have concerns about Donald Trump, uh, you know, as a human being, you know, and again, whether you agree or disagree, uh, that's a reality. And some of them, you know, may vote on character, what they believe to be character rather than what they believe to be their immediate, you know, economic self-interest. So what are the states that we should be watching over the course of the next few months as we lead into both uh, the nomination and then into the general elections? Well, the, the, the states that are going to get the attention in the next you know, several months you know, will be the states that determine the Democratic nominee, which in many ways are different from the states that will actually determine the presidency in the fall. Uh, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, big states, uh, they determined the election last time, 77,000 votes in those right. three states probably had gone differently. Uh, you know, Donald Trump would not have won. Florida is, is another state. Florida is, you know, for, you know, at least two decades uh, has been, you know, one of the closest states, one of the most competitive. Uh, Georgia, maybe. Arizona, maybe. Uh, many, I mean, Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, you know, will be, you know, one of the states that, you know, people see where the Trump campaign certainly seems to be paying more attention to that, where they think that they, it's a state that Hillary Clinton won, but the Trump campaign thinks that they could flip. Uh, that uh, in the opposite direction. I think that those are, you know, that, that gets you up to about seven states, you know, where, you know, people, you know, really need to pay, you know, close attention to in terms of following uh, this election. Ohio, maybe. Uh, you know, but those are, you know, those are, that, those really, uh, Colorado is another state, New Hampshire, uh, you know, but we're not going to hear much about swing voters in New Hampshire in the next two weeks, you know, leading up to the New Hampshire primary. But it, it's, I mean, those are the states. It's Colorado, Minnesota, New Hampshire, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin is the really core central ones, Florida uh, and Arizona and Georgia. So you didn't mention any of the coast states, uh, the, the ones that have the big numbers, obviously, California, New York, uh, but you have mostly the flyover states in, in your, on your radar screen right now. Yeah, look, I mean, it's in you know, states like New York and California, you know, I mean, unless something really, you know, unprecedented happens, we'll vote for the Democrats. Uh, Texas, 
uh, is, you know, like I, I think in the next several years, you know, Texas will be a competitive state, you know, for a number of reasons, but it's really expensive uh, to campaign and to uh, advertise in Texas. So it probably, you know, I, I don't want to go so far as to say it's a safe Republican state, but I'd say it's a probable uh, Republican state. That's a big win for them. I don't think that that is necessarily sustainable, you know, over the next, you know, several years. But yes, I mean, it's, I mean, the, 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 the really big state you know are almost it's almost like they have their own economic and political ecosystems and uh, you know don't exist completely separately and apart uh, but you know they they, they, they they have their own political behaviors uh, that are different from the swing states so what should we we what should we be watching over the next uh, little while is there any tells that uh, we should be and, and uh, the, the two things in the next seven days to watch are, you know, what happens in the Senate uh, in terms of, you know, witnesses, you know, specifically Bolton, and then six days from now are the Iowa caucuses. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, it's, you know, I mean, sometimes, you know, states, if they have really close uh, contests, uh, the results are not, you know, are not widely accepted even within 24 hours uh, because of the way in which it's ranked. But I, I do think that, you know, one witnesses and two Iowa, you know, are going to be the two big things that happen within the next seven days that are going to affect the political environment in the United States. Craig, thank you so much for your time. I hope we get to do this again in the near future. We can compare notes. Love to do that. It's always it's always a pleasure talking to you, and it's always a pleasure talking to our brothers and sisters in Canada. You know. Well, again, thank you so much, uh, Craig Varoga, joining us from Washington D.C. Today, I'm joined with David Weinberg, Vice President of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security. Hi, David. Thanks for joining us. Hello, Marcel, and shalom from Jerusalem. Thanks so much. David, it's really interesting that Israel is facing its third election in about 12 months. I think that sets some sort of record in terms of uh, democracies having so many elections in such a short period. Can you give us a little bit of a background as to what caused this uh, third election? Uh, sure, happy to do so. Actually, I think Italy holds the all-time record for the frequency of elections, but there's no question, you're right, this is unusual for Israel, and we've had a year of, more than a year now, of political instability, with the Netanyahu government being a caretaker government for over a year now. Uh, some say that suits Prime Minister Netanyahu just fine. Um, He's unable to cobble together a governing coalition in Knesset, so you throw uh, the political system into renewed elections as a way of extending your term. But it is, um, it is worrying. Before the uh, most recent election, um, last September, uh, analysts were calling this a year of political upheaval. After all, Prime Minister Netanyahu is under indictment for and three criminal investigations, and four top former generals of the Israel Defense Forces have lined up against him uh, in a rival party uh, in an attempt to overthrow him, and they tried twice um, and failed. So we've had a year of political stagnation. The interesting thing is, is that throughout the last three elections, the numbers basically haven't changed. Um, the right wing in Israeli politics holds about 55% of the vote. Um, including 80% of the vote in Jerusalem. Uh, the left wing holds the balance, and those numbers essentially haven't changed over close to a year and a half of uh, repeat elections. In other words, the core socio-political divide in Israel remains quite constant. Um, it's mainly explained by um, an income uh, ideological gap, Israel's version of identity politics, if you want to call it that, as well as the long shadow of the failed Oslo Accords and the regional upheavals, what's wrongly called the Arab Spring that's happening all around us. And I think Israelis have internalized the message that there are no magical solutions. 
um, to their big challenges, not in the security field, not economically, uh, or in the societal realm. There are no fairy tale diplomatic gambits worth taking, and in the end, there is no better magician to handle it all than Benjamin Netanyahu, who's been prime minister now for longer than anyone else in Israel's history, uh, over 10 years and four terms, uh, which leaves us with a lot of elect empty election campaigning and sloganeering, um, a thin cover for inertia and lethargy in Israeli politics. So what's going to break the logjam and get to a government, whether it's a renewed mandate for Netanyahu or it's a new government with uh, one of the other major parties? So there are um, three or four things that could rejigger the political landscape and, as you say, it break the logjam. What is, in simple political terms, if one of the um, swing coalition partners in Knesset, that's uh, Victor Lieberman's party, it's called the Israel Beitenu Party, it's a party made up of primarily Russian immigrants, um, if he switches sides. He had been partner in successive Netanyahu right-wing religious coalitions. He's now conducting a, a two-year-long political vendetta to bring Netanyahu down, but if he switches sides again, Netanyahu could have a coalition government. That's one possibility. Second possibility, and that's really the more interesting of, of the three I wanted to highlight, is that um, the current um, dramatic uh, diplomatic um, gambit that's playing out today in Washington, um, two and a half hours from now, President Trump is about to unveil his long-awaited uh, deal of the century, as he calls it, his plan for Israeli Arab, Israeli Palestinian peace. And while there isn't going to be any peace, unfortunately, because the Palestinians refuse to engage Israel and engage the Trump administration, it nevertheless holds the potential. This plan holds the potential to um, change the situation on the ground, to green light unilateral you know, Israeli action, to secure sovereignty over parts of Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, something that's been held in abeyance for over 50 years. Um, and that gives Netanyahu a diplomatic say, a diplomatic issue, a defense issue to go to the public in the four weeks left till our next election, four or five weeks, and campaign in territory that is uh, his baby, the diplomatic defense sphere, and try to distance the political conversation as much as possible from the indictments and his legal troubles. That's a second scenario. And the third scenario, which is in the opposite direction, is that um, Netanyahu fights an election, um, comes out on top, or ends up stalemated with his main rival, the blue and white center-left party, and then the Israeli Supreme Court steps in. Um, and there is an issue as to whether a political leader uh, facing lengthy trial uh, for three sets of criminal indictments um, can be tasked with forming the next government. Now, the Israeli law doesn't rule this out, but it will be challenged in the Israeli Supreme Court. The Israeli Supreme Court is the most interventionist court in the entire Western world. Uh, and some think that it's itching, aching, to kind of hand down a um, unprecedented ruling uh, which would instruct the president of Israel to choose someone else, that he can't task Netanyahu with forming the next government, even if he comes up on top in the polls, given the indictments against him. And that, of course, changes it. So in all three of your scenarios, you didn't outline an opposition option where the opposition could conceivably uh, take power or win uh, plurality of the seats. I I'm curious as to know why you don't see that as being a viable option. All of the ones that you've indicated center around Netanyahu and his Likud party. That's correct, Marcel. Um, and that's for two reasons. Uh, number one, the polls uh, do not show None of the polls show that um, the rival, the opposition, the Blue and White Party, um, which has never won an election, it's a relatively new party that's been 
cobbled together from four disparate pieces just over the last two years. They've never won an election. Uh, the polls do not show them having a stable coalition, um, no matter how you slice it. Um, in order to end up with 61 out of the 120 seats in Knesset, blue and white would have to bring in the ultra-Orthodox Jewish parties on the one hand, and the Israeli Arab parties on the other hand, that doesn't work. You'd have to bring in some of the hard right factions that are Netanyahu's right, um, together with uh, labor and merits, which are hard left. Um, even if it was theoretically doable, it's not a coherent government, um, wouldn't make for coherent policy making, wouldn't last long. Blue and white's only chance to head a next Israeli government is if somehow they were to partner with the Likud, and they won't do that as long as Netanyahu, who's under indictment, remains at the head of the Likud. That's how the talks uh, for coalition making fumbled uh, just several months ago. Netanyahu were to be knocked out by the Supreme Court, as I said, then there might be new possibilities for a Likud blue-white coalition, but that's a long way off. Now, some people have pointed out what's happening in Israel as a reason why proportional representation is not a good uh, way of selecting a government. And so is there some feeling that maybe Israel needs to change its electoral system? There's talk of that every once in a while. I don't see it gelling. Um, I'm not convinced that the system is the root cause of our political stagnation well, or people paralysis. Are saying, people are saying that these small religious and other uh, groups have too much power and too much sway in terms of a government. It, it doesn't lend itself. There hasn't been a majority Israeli government in almost 40 years. No, in 70 years. There's never been a Ten, majority okay, Israeli government. 70 years. Every Israeli government has been a coalition of larger parties with lots of these small, narrow sectoral interest parties, as you suggest. But I'll make an argument uh, for their value. Um, while it does make for messy coalition building um, and does give them uh, outsized power to blackmail um, successive Israeli governments for policies and particularly for budgets for their own pet projects and sub-communities, it nevertheless does give uh, many of Israel's really diverse and unique sub-communities a voice, which they wouldn't have um, in politics um, otherwise. It's very hard um, for ultra-Orthodox Jews to vote for um, a general part. Uh, they're very um, closed as a sub-sector of Israeli society. They um, stick with their own, they vote with their own. The same is true um, mm -hmm. of Israeli Arabs. Um, and the same is true of um, religious Zionists to some degree. Uh, the fact that they have a political outlet gives them a, uh, a role in Israeli politics, and gives them a sense of, some sh sense of shared belonging in national affairs. It's not all a bad thing. Now, I just want to slightly shift the conversation more of an international aspect and start with what's happening in Iran and what impact is that having on Israel and on Israeli politics? Okay, thank you for bringing that up, Marcel, because I think it is important for our listeners uh, to understand uh, the centrality um, to Israel uh, to all Israelis, to all Israeli political parties, to all the major leaders of the parties, of the, um, the security threat uh, coming from Iran. Um, Iran's um, naked um, march towards regional hegemony and its open and bald drive for nuclear weapons, its regional muckraking, um, its international terrorist um, endeavors, um, its undermining of um, relatively moderate Sunni Arab regimes that circle Israel, 
um, pose a grand strategic challenge for Israel. And cutting Iran down to size is both Israel's number one strategic priority, and it should be from Israel's perspective, the number one international um, security concern as well, because Iran threatens, as I said, not just Israel, uh, but many of uh, Israel and the West's Arab state partners in this region, um, and much beyond the Middle East as well. Uh, as you know, just about a month ago, um, President Trump uh, ordered a strike, uh, an assassination on Qasem Soleimani, who was the head of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, so-called Quds forces, which were the um, almost Nazi-like stormtroopers of the uh, Iranian regime, uh, the frontline uh, commandos um, that were running um, Shiite militia armies across the Middle East, including two of them on Israel's borders, that's Hamas in the south and Hezbollah in the north. Um, the strike on Soleimani um, was a brave and important act. Now, I know that the um, discussion of the Soleimani strike has, of course, become very political with the so bitterly divided uh, American, American political scene today. Almost nothing Trump can do can ever be acknowledged as being worthwhile, certainly not by um, his Democratic opponents. But in this case, um, he did a smart um, and brave thing, putting, drawing red lines in front of the Iranians um, is critically important. It's true on the nuclear file. It's true in terms of their um, terrorist operations abroad. Um, and one has to hope that the Iranians will draw the appropriate um, lessons. Make no mistake about it, Israel continues to interdict uh, Iranian weapons shipments uh, to Shiite armies on our borders in Lebanon and Syria in particular. Israel continues to strike at Iranian attempts to create a forward base in Syria against Israel, 4,000 kilometers from the Persian Gulf. They're trying to set up missile and army bases, Iranian-controlled missile and army bases on Israel's northern border. Um, and Israel's made it very clear that it will not allow that. And you mentioned Lebanon. Uh, in terms of that country, we've seen civil unrest. We've seen demonstrations in the streets. Nothing to do with Israel, but having to deal with local domestic uh, issues. How is that playing out? Lebanon is uh, one of those countries, and there are several more in this region, um, that have a, um, a flag, an ambassador at the UN, and they still appear on world maps, whether it's Google Maps or in our old paper atlases that some of us still have at home over a certain age, and yet it doesn't really exist. Um, Libya, as an ambassador at the UN, does not exist in this country anymore. It's divided into three parts with you know, rival armies still fighting it out. Yemen has long not existed as a unitary country. The same is true of Lebanon, and the same is true of Iraq. Uh, and in the specific uh, case of Lebanon, it's essentially a Hezbollah-controlled country. Hezbollah is a Shiite army, fully funded and backed by Iran, which has one of the largest armies in the Middle East, Hezbollah army in Lebanon is larger than most Western European armies. It holds anywhere from 120 to 180,000 rockets and missiles, all aimed at Israel. That's the largest rocket force, rocket and missile force aimed at any country in the world. Um, it's like, you know, the gun that you see in Act 1 of a play, you know it's going to go off somewhere in Act 3 or 4. Um, one has to know that the conflict between Hezbollah, backed by Iran and Israel, is just a question of time, and Israel will have to act one day to degrade enemy capabilities and um, prevent Hezbollah from unleashing that enormous firepower against Israel. Now, next door to Lebanon is Syria, and Syria had made the news for several years, but recently it's been very quiet as far as the news is concerned. What's the situation on Israel's northern border facing Syria? 
a great, great, great tragedy. Um, we're talking eight years of civil war um, in Syria. Again, this has nothing to do with Israel. Um, eight million people made into refugees, many of whom have flooded into Europe, as you know, creating this enormous refugee crisis, creating a normal political, enormous political crisis in Europe. One to two million people murdered, killed in the course of these um, uh, of this civil war. One over 100 different Islamic and Arab militia forces fighting in the civil war, backed by every disparate part of the Arab world. Uh, and it was only about two years ago that the war began to not tamper down, but shift in a clear direction, and that's because the Syrians called the Iranians and the Russians in. And Iranian troops, Iranian-backed Shiite militias on the ground, along with the Russian Air Force, now controlling Russian airspace, um, basically won the war for the incumbent regime, that's the Assad regime. Now, Assad hasn't regained control of the entire country, but he's gained, regained control of most of the country. And Syria is at the moment a Russian and Iranian protectorate. And as I mentioned beforehand, under that cover, the Iranians are seeking to move um, forward troops to create a front line against Israel in southern Syria, and that won't stand. Now, now, you mentioned Russia, and I saw that uh, Putin was recently in Jerusalem. It seems that the Russians now want to insert themselves into the Middle East in a more activist role compared to the U.S., which seems to be backing out of the Middle East. Uh, that's correct. Uh, Putin was here in Jerusalem last week for the International Holocaust Forum, along with over 50 heads of state, kings, queens, prison, princes, presidents, including the Governor General of Canada, Prince Charles. Um, He's not the, the Governor Prince, General, but just for the <laughs> Prince Charles of, uh, of England, uh, President of Germany, uh, and so forth. And tomorrow, Tomorrow, Prime Minister Netanyahu is flying from Washington, where he's about to hold a big press conference with President Trump to meet uh, Putin in Moscow. And um, and it's, it'll be the 10th or 20th time the two leaders have met over the last several years. Uh, Israel has a, a very dicey situation. On the one hand, Israel's greatest ally and most important strategic partner is the United States. On the other hand, Putin has moved into the region uh, made himself in many ways the sheriff of the region. His air force flies on our northern border and Israel needs to coordinate with the Russians in order uh, to continue pushing the Iranians back. And Putin, of course, is playing a double game where he allows the Iranians to move in and then allows Israel to strike at the Iranians at the same time. And in a situation where um, the United States is withdrawing from direct active intervention reason. Again, it's not so easy to leave the Middle East as Obama discovered and Trump is discovering now as well. And when the Iranians pushed too far, as they did when they killed Americans in Iraq, the United States is forced to respond. But President Trump has made it very clear that he does not want to send American troops uh, into Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, uh, anymore. Um, he's looking to um, handle Middle East crisis, crises from afar. I expect that we will yet see a renewed U.S.-Iran negotiation, if not this year, um, after the American uh, elections, uh, perhaps in 2021, because that is what Trump wants. That's what, what a Democratic candidate uh, will want. And then that will raise the question about uh, will it be a real negotiation that will hold the Iranian feet to the fire not the, and not reach a sellout, softy deal with the Iranians as did President Obama. Now, the other world superpower is China. And China is pursuing a very different course of action, not military, but economic, and has reached out and had deals with Israel and a number of other Arab countries. Would you care to comment on that? China is not a major 
defense or diplomatic player in the Middle East. It is, as you suggested, a growing an economic force, both in the Middle East and in Africa. Um, and Israel has set out over the last decade under Netanyahu and done so very successfully. Israel has set out to expand its um, global economic and diplomatic partnerships um, beyond Europe uh, and beyond the United States. Uh, Israel has been very successful uh, in developing very large and important uh, economic partnerships with India and China, uh, with African states, uh, with South American states. There is a debate, there is a debate here in Israel about how much Chinese investment and how much Chinese investment in Israeli infrastructure uh, Israel ought to allow. It's a debate that you're familiar with in Canada mm -hmm. um, as well. The Americans have made it very clear that they um, take a jaundiced look at uh, Chinese investment in critical Israeli infrastructures, particularly those that might that have their way to telecommunications and ports. Uh, and these are issues that are under discussion between Israel and the United States, and there have been some tensions on it. Um, but um, overall, it's a good thing for Israel. Uh, the Chinese have been buying Israeli technology and investing in Israeli infrastructure projects dramatically. They're also investing heavily in Egypt, uh, which Israel views as a good thing, um, because Egypt is, as always, an economic basket case and needs to be supported and kept in a Western uh, alliance, which is also an alliance with Israel. David, uh, we've run out of time. There's so many more subjects I'd love to cover with you, and hopefully you'll be available to chat about them, as well as the Trump Peace Initiative, which is going to be presented later today, as you point out. Glad to have been with you. Be glad to talk again. Um, stay warm over there in Canada. I won't tell you how bummy it is over here. Oh, don't make me jealous. I'm joined by David Weinberg, Vice President of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security, based in, in Jerusalem. Thank you so much for joining us today. Joining me today from Vienna, Austria, is Christoph Hoffinger. He's a managing partner of the firm Sora, which is focused on research and political consulting. Thank you for joining us today, Christoph. Thank you for having me, Marcel. It's good to see you. As likewise. Christoph, give us a sense of the mood of Europe in terms of its political uh, focus these days. There's been a lot of uh, discussion in Canada and the U.S. about the tendency of moving to the right. Uh, there's been a number of elections that have taken place over the course of the past few years where right-wing parties have either won or have uh, elected strong numbers. And there's a feeling that this is changing the European outlook. Well, 2019, last year, was a really interesting year. And everybody thought at the European parliamentary elections in May that it would be the big questions, is the European right gathering traction? And this is going to be a big battle between a nationalist Europe and a, and a Europe that is uh, more uh, based on diversity, but working together in diversity. And then what happened on in May is that it actually is something that we call the green wave. It turned out to be an election about climate change. And the movement that was in the streets, uh, like inspired by Greta Thunberg, the Swedish activist, right. had actually swapped into the voting booths, in, into the electoral uh, behavior, especially of uh, voters under, uh, below 30 years old. So we also see that in Eurobarometer uh, uh, surveys that have tracked what Europeans are concerned about. And it's much less unemployment than it used to be because the economy is doing better. It's also much less immigration that made mostly, most countries really nervous around 2015 with uh, the big movement that came to Europe. 
So now it's uh, especially among young motors um, that the most pressing urgent question is uh, protection of the environment and solving the climate crisis. Now there was a recent regional election in Austria that just concluded uh, last week. Can you describe how that election reflects what you've just uh, shared with with us? Yeah, the surprise uh, a couple of days ago in, in a small province in Austria, the Burgenland, was that the Social Democrats gained an absolute majority in votes and seats. And nobody really expected that because the Social Democrats throughout Europe show in many countries, not everywhere, but in many countries, signs of a crisis. And in Austria, on the federal level, uh, Social Democrats had a tough time in, in the general election in last fall. But um, the regional strategy in this case of the Social Democratic uh, provincial governor was interesting because He's a little tough on immigration, or sometimes uh, more than a little tough, which is comparable to the Danish Social de Democrats. But mm -hmm. migration is not the only part of his agenda. There's a lot of typical Social Democratic issues, like a minimum wage, for instance, or dealing with health care. And he, they also took in in some green concerns, they, they're producing more renewable energy than they consume, and, and they, they're going for biological agriculture or ecological. So uh, with this mix of issues, also the Social Democrats in a particular election uh, was pretty successful. It shows to, to see what the general trend behind is that uh, you you need strong candidates that can um, give people the feeling that they stand for change. So it's not the time to be passive. It never was for politicians, but this is probably in Europe the worst time mm -hmm. uh, to seem either complacent or passive. Um, and if you give uh, people the idea that you also being from a traditional party can be a change candidate, candidate then, then there might be some surprising successes, even for Social Democrats these days. Interesting. You mentioned earlier that the focus among Europeans is on the economy, uh, even though it's still very strong, it's, it's the economy and uh, the climate change are, are the two. Let me just shift slightly and talk about what impact you feel the whole Brexit situation is going to have in Europe because in a few days it will mark the uh, end date for the uh, UK's participation in the EU and uh, it will go it alone. What political implications will that have? Brexit has a paradoxical effect uh, on the remaining countries that, that, that still will be the European Union. Uh, in, the, in the starting in February. Uh, on the one hand, of course, that the fact that UK leaves the European Union is weakening this project. It's a, basically a fifth of the economy uh, with, uh, and, and the UK has strong ties all, all over the world, a strong financial center, uh, not to talk about soccer and, and, and other uh, important uh, strengths of, of the UK. So it is a loss and it, it's, it's, it's uh, sad for Europeans and uh, nobody is, is happy to see them go. It, there is, uh, and that's the paradox, there's also an upside, um, which is that um, the Europeans uh, with uh, some a few exceptions, but all in all the remaining countries uh, seem to be closer to have an understanding that they now uh, need to be successful in um, politics that uh, have, have an, are visionary. And it wasn't always easy to negotiate things with the UK. There were also often very difficult uh, debates about the budget sometimes also foreign policy. So um, there it might also 
inspire those after we, we have mourned the loss, uh, inspire the remaining countries in the European Union to work together more closely and to be a little bit more ambitious and a bit, a bit more brave uh, in what the Europe tries to achieve. So with the UK leaving the EU, that would fall on two countries, France and Germany, to be the leaders now that uh, Britain is, is leaving. And in Germany, Angela Merkel has signaled that she's retiring and there'll be a new leader uh, in the coming uh, year in Germany. How is that going to play out? Well, Germany will have uh, interesting elections, they're, they're planned. Uh, in a couple of years, or in actually in 221. And um, the classical situation in Germany is with a, with a centrist government of the two traditional party, that, and this is a pattern we observed in many other countries, also in Austria for decades here, that in that case, the, the parties on, on the left or right can benefit from that if there's an oversized centrist government. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Greens are very strong in Germany. They're in the post, they're ahead of the Social Democrats, which is an interesting uh, phenomenon to observe. It may be possible that in a few countries in Europe, the Green Party may become the dominating force on the left mm -hmm. side. This is definitely become an option which was unthinkable maybe 20 or even 10 years ago. Has also to do with the climate crisis, of course. Um, and there's also on the right wing side, there's, there's of course parties uh, that are, are right wing populist in Germany, the AfD. So what's going uh, to happen in Germany, maybe, is uh, uh, that we will see a different kind of government. In Austria, we just recently uh, had an, an unusual collaboration in our government. Since a, uh, a, only a two weeks, we have a government of the Conservative Party with the Greens. And many in Germany also say this could be an interesting option, but it's a little early uh, to predict that. One thing is for sure, whatever the outcome is, the Germans will take responsibility for Europe, whatever the government is, and they will work closely with France. And speaking of France, how is Macron and uh, his government uh, holding up? They were challenged by some nationalist right-wing parties in, in uh, domestic elections. Yes, the, 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 the challenge will remain and um, Macron shows uh, that uh, even if you're a popular leader, once you get in the actual dealing with the climate crisis and you raise gasoline prices, then it might be only a small step like to have people in the streets. Mm -hmm. However, what the background is for people being angry at gasoline prices is something deeper is, is uh, like concerns uh, about the distribution of wealth and the costs of living. And sometimes this is like a, a symbolic uh, issue that makes people angry. And now he's dealing with uh, labor market reforms, especially the pension system. Uh, he remained as the change, the change candidate that Macron was, he remains a change politician. And of course that he encounters resistance with a change agenda. And it's very hard to predict from outside if he will like be successful or if his reforms will not be carried through and he'll get stuck. Mm -hmm. What's clear, he's definitely and, and unquestioned in an unquestioned way pro-European. So also from the French side, there is a, a very clear commitment to working together, especially with Germany, but also the other countries for uh, a strong Europe. Now, not a member of the EU, but certainly cast a shadow is Russia. And, and so 
what is happening in Russia that may impact on European politics? Yeah, the, the Russia is is something that plays in into Europe, and and we um, see, the, for instance, in the example of Ukraine, where 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 is neither uh, the European nor the Russians um, were able to sit together and find a solution for a country that has has had really very difficult years in especially in the past four or five years and now there there is um, some new movement with president zelensky him him also building a relationship uh, with putin and and some hope for this country but um europeans um are um for sure in some countries ready to have better relationships with Russia and probably the or very likely the Europeans and Russia would benefit from it but it, it's it's a very tricky and steep climb and it's it's not sure if if that will be possible okay a lot more we can discuss unfortunately we've uh, run out of time I'd like to thank uh, Christoph Hoffinger who's a managing partner with SOMA uh, an international political consultant, researcher, pollster, uh, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Christoph. Thank you, Marcel. My pleasure.